So hello again, I'm back here. <laughs> Actually, I'm uh, as as can be seen, I'm uh, I'm both in Aalto University and but but more nowadays in, in Taltec. So full time full professor in, in Taltec and uh, still something some activities in Aalto, but slowly slowly being uh, being in, in Taltec. So but this work has been done mainly in in Aalto University, but we have applied the tool to think about how many icebreakers Estonia will need in, uh, until 2050 year. So at the end, I will tell you how many icebreakers you need. But I will first go through the tool. It's a long process. We have been developing it almost 10 years, actually, on some European Union projects. A lot of people have been involved. Uh, so we have my colleague Masura, uh, my young, young professor in our university, Lulia Ling, and Alexander Kondrenko, our postdoc students. In, in, in this. So, why we have the tool? Because the, the, we have a big challenge. Nobody, we should have a tool to evaluate what it is making, how many icebreakers Finland will need, and how many icebreakers maybe Sweden will need, and how many icebreakers maybe Estonia will need. And that's the main, main uh, motivation to make a simulation tool. And there are big changes happening as we know, we have climate change, it will have a big effect to the ice. And how to, how to take that into account? And the other big effect that this airy ships means that there's more environmental friendly ships and they have less engine power. Uh, and maybe the hull shape is not optimum for ice breaking, so we will have a, a very bad ice conging vessels, more very bad ice conging vessels, but very good environmental vessels. So. What is the effect to the icebreaker capacity we need? So these are the two big questions we, what we want to answer with this tool. And typically, this is just to show you the, how, uh, how, how the icebreaker, how the icebreaker operations in, in the Bay of Botnia is coordinated between Finland and Sweden. It's a very close uh, cooperation. Can you see it here? Yeah. yeah. Here you can see that they have a uh, they call it IPNet, internet-based system, then they can get, they can get uh, once, once a day a satellite picture about ice, and then they can see from this uh, internet-based system that where the vessels are going, what is the next harbor, what kind of vessel, where the, where the icebreakers are. So you can get immediately very nice picture which icebreaker to assist the next vessel. So that's how the uh, icebreaker captains who is in charge of this problem, that's the tool they are using every day. But they, it's a daily based tool, they can, they use it very efficiently daily, but our aim is to think about future. That can we simulate the, simulate the ice conditions, can we simulate the icebreaker operations, can we simulate the cargo vessel operations in ice, so that we can, we can, we know up to next next 10, 20 years, what the traffic will look like. So that's that's the background why we're using it. And there are a lot of challenges. Nobody else has even tried to make this kind of a simulation tool, as we heard from Tarmo, that every simulation model is, is wrong, but it can be useful. <laughs> so, and in our case, it's it's very complicated system to simulate ice, varying ice conditions, varying vessels, and how the, icebreaker, how the icebreakers are, are working. Icebreaker captain knows very well how to, know, how to assist the next vessel, but how we can give that icebreaker, icebreaker captain decision-making process to the computer. Let's see, we are, on, we are still working, we have some models, but still we have done a lot of, lot of interviews for the experienced captains, and, and let's see. So there are challenges, and, and, and other challenges, uh, ice conditions are every day different, and every winter different. We have, uh, we have uh, this kind of a very hard winter on the left corner, then the whole Baltic Sea is frozen. It happened last time, 1987, well, some years ago, but not so long time ago. And I think it's still, it's still possible that we have the whole Baltic Sea frozen, and then we have a number of challenges. But of course, nowadays, typically, we have more, much more wild, mild winters. We have only ice on the, on the very north and very east. And then some, sometimes, we, on, on average winter, we have uh, the Bay of, Bay of Botnia is frozen and Kalvo Finland is frozen. So that's an average winter. 
So, but we have to simulate, think about the effect of climate change on the, on the ice conditions and varying ice extent. But anyway, the, the main message is that there's a big scatter in ice every winter is different. So our simulation model, it's, we call it agent-based discrete event simulation. We discreetly simulate every event happening between the icebreaker and the cargo vessel. And we simulate the speed of cargo vessel when we know the enzyme power of cargo vessel and, and how shape we can get a rough estimate how much how thick ice they can break. We call it HV curve, it's ice thickness, uh, ship speed curve. And we change ice conditions, we change the waterway delays, and we have one mile per one mile. We heard about in previous presentation that is environmental data, like ice conditions is one, one mile by one mile uh, uh, grid. So we are using the same one mile per one mile. So in that one mile per one mile, we have the same constant ice conditions, but the ice conditions are changing along, along the fairway. And we simulate everything. Cargo vessels, icebreakers, and then, and then we have done some validation. Well, background for you, if my people, everybody will know that we have in Finland, we have at the, at the moment seven icebreakers plus Contio. So uh, we have uh, Urho class, Urho class vessels getting very old. Otso Contio class, quite old, but not so old. And then we have Norica Fennica, multipurpose vessels. And the newest icebreaker is icebreaker Polaris, LNC vessel uh, built in, in 2016. So we have a, this is our fleet. And of course we, because it's a Urho, Urho class vessels, they are getting soon 50 years old. So it's getting to the limit, but, but we need government funding as we discussed about money. So at the end, so icebreaker is 100 million euros. So so let's see when we get, get money from government update. They are still doing very well, I think. But, but anyway, that's, that's the background. And then the challenge for us is this kind of graph. I'm, I'm sure this um, uh, experienced captains know this very well, <laughs> like Jukka. So and when we are in open, the first, first part is open water speed. Uh, in open water, we quite nicely know that it's constant. So the ship speed is, when you have the same engine power, the ship speed is constant. But when we come to the ice part, then, then the challenges start. So many things can happen. Ship can, the speed will decrease. It can get stuck in ice. It has to wait icebreaker assistance. Then ice, icebreaker assistance has to do some towing and then leaving it again and then again it goes independently and, and so and this is only a few our drafts uh, showing the, the challenge when we want to simulate this kind of a dynamic system there are a lot of a lot of challenges and i hope i can give you some uh, indication about the challenges but this is only a few our craft quite old one ms camera the ship i was on board a lot because i did my doctor thesis being on board and method ice loading so it's a, it's a few hour only a few hour graph and this is our, how our simulation model works. We, we make these delays. We, we think about where the vessels can go. Uh, and icebreakers, uh, every vessel is following these uh, delays. And then we have HV curve to determine the ship speed. When we know ice thickness, for every vessel we have a HV curve. When we, when we know ice thickness, we know what is the ship speed in independent navigation. Independent navigation means that it's alone in ice, so it has uh, some speed, but typically it's behind an icebreaker and then it has a much higher speed. So we have two types of curves in level ice and behind an icebreaker. And then ice conditions, they're defined by equivalent ice thickness, so we only use one parameter, come back to that. And we can simulate this, this con icebreaker assistance in convoys and towing and, and, and so on. And this is a typical HV curve, how we define it, that we have a ship speed in the y-axis and a level ice thickness in the, in the x-axis. So, and this kind of a, like a, for icebreaker, this, in that case, two meter ice is the, is the maximum ice thickness. So then the speed is zero in level ice. But behind then, in the channel, 
behind an icebreaker or an open and other channel so that the, it can go much thicker, thicker ice. So for every cargo vessel we have developed, we have about 40 this kind of uh, HV curves. Every, of course, for every icebreaker we have uh, this kind of curves, and then for every cargo vessel, so about 40 different curves. When we know the enzyme power hull shape, so we can we have uh, some simple calculation methods to get roughly right curves. It's not ac totally accurate, but good enough. And then let's see, can I show you how it works? Yeah. You can see that uh, how we how the ships are, are going. Uh, so the different colors, it, this is a semantic, it's not a real case, but it's a semantic picture about different ice thickness. And as you can see how the ships are moving, they are coming, they are coming from open water to this, to this kind of a, where the ice will start. And we get this uh, arrivals, arrival time from AIS data. And when we know the arrival time, we start to simulate <coughs> how it then goes forward. And then it goes to the harbor, <coughs> stays for a harbor for a while, and then, then leaves again, and then we simulate from the harbor to the ice edge, typically in a, in a Vasa, in a Merenkurku Quarken, Quarken area, so typically where we don't have any ice. So that's how it works, that we simulate every event, every vessel, every event, and then about, then icebreakers are waiting somewhere, and then they when they know that ships are coming, they start to move towards assisting. That's how it works, uh -huh. okay. And then how we get these <coughs> HV curves? We have done a lot of numerical simulation tools, actually long history. Here we can see that one challenge is that when we have a moving ice, this ice, uh, this ice uh, channel is not open, we have a wind and the channel will be closed, and we have a totally different resistance. So we have made uh, tools to take that into account uh, as well. So that's why we heard about this from FMI, that we're also very happy to know the ice pressure and ice movement in our model, as, as of course we want to know ice thickness and other parameters. And then how to validate our models, we have our own ice water, ice, ice tank in Otanemi campus. So we can do model scale testing. Here is one example about, <coughs> uh, we call it double acting vessel. It goes staying ahead in ice and forward in open water so they can optimize the hull for open water going forward and they only go stern in ice <coughs> so that they only ice strengthen the stern part. So it, it's more optimum for open water. And uh, of course, this kind of a model scale testing as such is a big, big, big problem how to scale. Typically the model is one to 20, so we have to scale the ice and that's a problem how, how we can make 20 times thinner ice and 20 times, uh, 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 20 times weak, weaker ice than full scale ice. And that's, that's a big, big uh, that's the main talent in ice model scale testing. Okay. But we have a theoretical modeling about ice breaking. Uh, we think about physical, physical models about how ice breaks and, and, get the, and then we can validate the models with testing. And here are some examples about the validation. So in two, in two ice thicknesses, very little bit, something like 30 centimeter and something like 60, 70 centimeter ice. So we get quite good accuracy, even though I think our Simulated results give a little bit less, uh, less, uh, but about 10 to 20 percent accuracy to evaluate the HV curves, and that's that's enough in for our simulation purposes. And then we have done a lot of studies about different uh, different zip types. Okay, sorry, different zip types. So we, we evaluate when we know the main dimensions, length. Uh, breadth and drafts and hull shape, so we can evaluate the ice packing capability and then we can get a lot of this kind of eight sphere curves for every different vessel and we have about for 40 different types. And then we have developed some regression formula that when we know the main parameters of the vessel, like 
like the main dimensions and some uh, important hull angles at the bow, length of the midship section and, and this kind of a parameter. So we have a very straightforward, <coughs> simple regression formula to calculate these HV curves very quickly. And then we have different curves for different purposes. Okay, then uh, and after this HV curve challenge is done, then we have a very big challenge about equivalent ice thickness. So if you have typical ice picture, this is a typical ice in the Baltic Sea, can happen in Gulf of Finland, can happen in Bay of Botnia. And we want to make only one parameter. As you can see, we want to use this kind of an equivalent level ice thickness in our calculations. So, and the idea is that we try to physically simulate the ship resistance in different ice conditions. Like here we have a lot of ridges and some new ice, very new, thin new ice and some lot of ridges. And then we, we numerically simulate the ship performance and then we make equivalent level ice thickness that we get the same simulation results. The speed of vessel is the same as it is in more complicated ice conditions because our simulation tool cannot, uh, it has to be simple, this uh, HV curve. We have only one parameter, otherwise, otherwise it gets too slow. And, uh, and then to do it, here's an example about, uh, there are many ways to calculate equivalent ice thickness and a lot of uh, different formulations. And depending on the, what kind of ice you have, you have different, different uh, formula, different formulation to do it. But here's very simple, we call it equivalent volume thickness that we have. When we have ridges, so typically the ridge, we have ridges above the water and below the water. And ice density is 0.9. It means that 10% of the ice on this kind of a block, when we have a lot of ice blocks together, 10% is above the water and 90% is below the water. And as we cannot simulate, we cannot numerically make uh, this simulation tool, it's too slow to simulate every ridge. So we, we change it. One way to do it is just this volume thickness that we just calculate the total volume of this ridge ice, and then we increase the thickness. As you can see here, that this is a levelized thickness, and then the thicker, thicker part on the right, on the right is, uh, is the equivalent level ice thickness. So that's the, that's the main idea how we do it. And we have, again, a lot of different methods to do it. And, and uh, a little bit also challenges what kind of methods always to use. But, but maybe you understand the, the basic idea that we, we use for ice conditions. We only use this kind of equivalent, equivalent level ice thickness is our main parameter. So these are the basic principle of the model, and then I give you two or three case studies, uh, what, what we have applied it. There's one case study is from Bay of Botnia, and then uh, <coughs> another case study is for Estonia. So typical ice conditions in the Bay of Botnia uh, can be uh, 67 centimeter thick ice, and you can see that there's Otto Contio Urho, Finnish ice icebreakers and then Frey and Atle and Ümer, various icebreakers. So we, we, to, we take that into account and then we, when we know the traffic, we start simulating. And in a typical one month period, there is few hundred vessels. There is few hundred one, one, a, one a ice class vessels and a little bit less one a super ice class vessels. So one a means that it can can navigate independently relatively thin ice, let's say up to 30, 40 centimeter. This one ice class 1A can roughly, but one ice class 1A super can navigate in 70, 80 centimeter. So a little bit better enzyme power, better hull shapes. And then we simulate and one important parameter is waiting time because our government is collecting fairway dues. Every, every vessel coming to Finnish Harpo, they have to pay about, well, 10, 20,000, 30,000 euro, depending on the ice class. And whenever they visit Finland, and government is collecting money, and government is using that money 
to give to give icebreaker assistance. Icebreaker assistance doesn't cost anything. It's today free. And but then when government is collecting this um, uh, uh, this uh, visit fair way, fair way dues as they call it, they have promised that the maximum waiting time for cargo vessels is four hours. That they guarantee that our icebreaker system is so good that nobody don't have to wait longer than on average for hours. It, it can be sometimes longer, sometimes short, but on average. And it works quite okay on a normal winter, hard winter, we have some challenges. But the most important result here is that when we simulated the waiting time for this one month period, and then we compared because uh, these icebreakers are collecting the waiting time data on this IP net system and and we found that our model, even though there are a lot of challenges, in that case it was only 2% error and uh, of course it's almost too, too close to, uh, to be actually too good because we have some other simulations. I think in my opinion 10 to 20% accuracy is, 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 but it showed that it basically our simulation tool is not right but can be useful as we heard because it, you get something out. And one another imp very important topic today is this uh, uh, environmental uh, cargo vessels. There are more and more vessels coming who will fulfill these environmental uh, requirements, mean, meaning that they have less engine power and they have optimum hull for open water, but not optimum hull for ice. And we make a quick estimation that if you have, uh, it's, it's from zero to 100% eddy vessels, now we have Present waiting time is uh, something like uh, the, oh, the overall waiting time. We calculate everything together. It's about 1,000 hours today. But if we have uh, if we have 20% uh, air vessels, waiting time is double. If we have 50% air vessel, waiting time is triple. And if we have uh, let's say 70%, which might happen in the near future, this waiting time is seven times higher than today. It means that our, our winter navigation system works quite nicely until the amount of these uh, environmental friendly vessels is not too high. But uh, as this is, a, this is a trend, so this means that we might need much more icebreakers in future uh, when these can, cargo vessels are getting uh, environmental friendly. So, that was one result of this study. Uh, and we have all been discussing, especially Ulla is not here anymore, but Ulla is very, very happy to co think about this waiting time is one KPI, but maybe the economic, the whole economy for the society is another. Can we think about that as a, as a KPI? Or let's say the total CO2 is one KPI. So. Uh, now we are now we are planning to maybe we can use this tool to think about some other ways to to to, to think about the winter navigation system, and it's it's sort of political discussions because the hard ports in the north they want that we need icebreakers even though it's very expensive to get cargo to the we have a lot of steel factories uh, wood factories for and, and this a uh, lot of industry in the in the in the in the northern cities and and. They will only only work when we have this icebreaker assistance. And so, if we go to this economic basics, it gets life very complicated. How to how to do it? But let's see. At the moment, we have done only the waiting time KPI. But let's see. We might develop the tool also for economic and uh, CO2. Okay. And then another another case study. We started this summer actually. I think Estonia government, Estonia is also thinking about how many icebreakers Estonia might need 2050. And uh, to do the study, so we changed, we had um, done the model for the Bay of Botnia, but during the summer we updated the model for Gulf of Finland, so we, we went through all the Estonian harbors and Estonian icebreakers, there are, there are three, Botnica, Tarmo and uh, Eva, Potnika is now in Canada, but three icebreakers basically. And uh, similarly, we got the cargo flow from AI's data and also 
this Ulla Tapanese's group help us to think about what kind of cargo flow we'll have today and future. And then from AIS data, we got the ships are coming in from the system from west, east, and north. And then we started to simulate how is the system working. Ice conditions for future we get from uh, uh, Taltec Maritime Institute. And uh, the main, okay, I come back to that, but we, we simulated until 2050. What might the winters be? I come back to that. That was very interesting. And then we got the ice cone. And the blue color here means, by the way, the, the darker the blue, the thicker the ice. So we have, we have very accurate, our simulation model is very accurate. Uh, one, one mile by one mile accuracy. So the darker the color, the thicker the ice. And that data we get from Taltec Maritime Institute. And then we started to simulate that. Uh, the icebreakers, and we had we had one icebreaker in, in, in this bay of Pernu and one to three icebreakers in the Gulf of Finland. And the question is, the question was that how many icebreakers we need on those areas, and uh, and the scenarios are given here. So we had a uh, on this study we had a uh, lot of we have a Taltec, we have uh, uh, Arctic, and some experienced uh, icebreaker captains from from Finland. So it was a consulting work. So, so we, we evaluated that the Gulf of Finland primary icebreaker should, have, it should be about 30 megawatt icebreaker, so a little bit more than, I think Potnika is 9 megawatt, so a little bit more than Potnika. And then we can have an, we have, can have one primary icebreaker in Gulf of Finland, let's say outside outside Tallinn or, or outside the other northern harbor, harbors or we can have a second icebreaker 9 megawatt and third icebreaker 6 megawatt. These are the three scenarios we were studying and always the Gulf of Riga icebreaker was 5.5 megawatt like a current EVA close to EVA. EVA is something similar. So that was our scenario. Then we studied different winters. So we had a, it's a typical mild winter on the left, typical normal winter on the right, and then very hard winter in, in these areas, meaning that the whole Bay of Bernou is covered by ice. And, uh, and as you can see, see the, the icebreaker, uh, icebreaker possibilities, what we need. So that was our, so we simulated using these ice conditions and then think about the future. So the main conclusion shortly is that let's say that the hard winters are may, maybe today every five years, every six years, but in future hard winters may be only every ten, every 10 years, but we can still have hard winters also here. And it means that we have to be prepared. It's the same in Finland and Sweden, that this hard winter is possible even though the probability is less than before. So we have to be prepared on all of our hard winters, normal winters, mild winters. And our main result is on this slide, showing that in, on mild winter, this one icebreaker in Gulf of Finland and one icebreaker in, in Bay of Bernou is, is enough. The waiting, maximum waiting time is less, less than two hours, is now minutes. 110 minutes means that less than two hours. But even on, on average winter, this one icebreaker in Gulf of Finland is, is not enough. We have about, the waiting time is about eight hours average. But if we have two icebreakers in Gulf of Finland on average winter, the waiting time is again less than two hours, less than three hours, and, and so on. And then on, on hard winter, even these three icebreakers in Gulf of Finland is not enough. The, waiting times go something like seven, seven, seven hours or, or something. So, but that's a very short, only few days, let's say, this kind of a hard. So the main conclusion from our study, I think this was also the final report, what we did. We have, we have delivered the report to Estonian government, and now we wait what they want to do. But so our recommendation on this research was that 
Estonia vi need one icebreaker in, in Bay of Berno and, and two icebreakers in Gulf of Finland. And uh, of course, uh, now we have uh, Estonia has Potnika that can still continue, let's say, next 10 years. But Tarmo is very old and, and then this Eva is quite old. So, so our conclusion is that, that also Estonia might need some new icebreakers. So, that was our conclusion, and we don't, of course, know how it goes forward in the, in the, in the Estonian government. So that was a short summary about how to make a simulation tool. Very complicated topic, but after, after hard work and long time of uh, many meetings, discussions with, uh, with icebreaker captains, especially Väylä Virasto in Finland has been very active to help us. So we have a, we have a let's say, first version of simulation tool. We have validated it. Accuracy is varying, but 10 to 20, 30 percent accuracy. And we can use that to evaluate future icebreaker needs. We can think about the future economic winter navigation in the, in the, in the Finland, Sweden, and Estonia, and then also future environmental regulations. What can it affect? What is the most best way, best way to, 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 to save fuel and, and make more environmental friendly? Right, thank you. And there are some, we have done some papers if you want to have a more look. Questions? Thank you. Yes. Do we have any questions? Thank you very much for your presentation. Questions from the audience? Maybe, uh, do you agree that two icebreakers is needed for Estonia or? <laughs> Because Hello from the ministry side as well. Um, as I'm familiar with your um, icebreaking analysis and what you have done uh, in Taltech and together with Ulla, so thanks for this uh, job as well. But uh, my question is that what would be your advice that how we should get the new icebreaker? Should we build it up, the new one, or should we charter it like the Potnika? <laughs> what, what will be your uh, advice in that case? Thank you. Yeah, of course, luckily I'm not in the Estonian government to make decisions, but <laughs> chartering is good. The main challenge in chartering is that when there's a hard winter, everybody needs icebreakers. So you can charter on mild winter, but <laughs> on hard winter, chartering is more risky. Of course, it's much cheaper because then you can charter when you need, because when you make an icebreaker, it's very, very expensive. So chartering has a, a risks are higher. There's no icebreakers in hard winter because it's hard winter here. It's also typical hard winter in, in other, other, other parts of the northern hemisphere. Uh, and then, then, uh, then uh, what was the other way about the startering? And so, uh, uh, and then, then uh, other important is the is kind of we call it multi-purpose icebreaker that you, you use it for icebreaking in winter, but then think about something else. Like uh, we have this uh, wind windmill coming, like maintenance of a windmill. It can be some exercise in summertime. So to combine that uh, ice breaking in winter and then doing some other activities in summertime, I think that's the, that's maybe the best because sartering is, is, is uh, especially to get a good icebreak when we hard winter <coughs> hard winter in Kalfa Finland we have about 70 centimeter thick ice <coughs> it's very risky to only based on sartering so I think at least one new icebreaker you, you might need uh, to make it optimized for your purposes and then maybe a second or third can be sartered risks are less but it's very complicated problem Okay, Penti, this is a very, very interesting story. But how about, uh, about uncertainties in climate change? I remember that some months ago we, will hear, we heard that the Gulf Stream will stop 2025. Of course, it certainly will not stop, but it might weaken and cause to us some cold winter. So <laughs> can we take somehow this into account as uh, some special uh, extreme? Yeah, it's a very good question, of course, as well. Uh, so, yeah, uh, 
I don't know what is the probability for this uh, Gulf Stream to turn, but if it turns, it will have a dramatic effect to many other things. So we didn't we didn't take that into account because it will change everything. Then we have hard winters every every every. Then hard winter is every winter almost. <laughs> it has a very big effect. We can, but then we can go by skiing. I can come to work from. I can come to my home from Espo to Tallinn by skiing every day. So <laughs> that's a good point. But hopefully it will not turn because it has a dramatic effect. I hope so. But I, I'm not expert. We have time for one more question from the audience. If not, then uh, thank you very much again. Thank you.